Tradition and expectations run deep within a family. And although these two things are often meant in good faith, the immense pressure put on children can sometimes hold dire consequences. But in January of 2007, a gruesome discovery would shock the residents of Shibuya and those further afar. And as the case's details unfolded, many were left with disgust. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Izumi Muto. This video pulls us back to Japan, and this story in particular shocked many people across the nation. But what exactly happened to Izumi and Yuki Muto? And of course, just to let you know, that I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here weekly. So if that's your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So please, grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and sit back. This is the case of Izumi Muto. Ohayou gozaimasu. Welcome back to the beautiful and vibrant country of Japan, folks. Famous for Mount Fuji, cherry blossoms, and its many Inari shrines, Japan is a country that is full of many breathtaking sights. And blending quaint traditionalism with modern elegance, the country does very well to offer the best of both worlds. Today we're travelling to the ever-sprawling megacity of Tokyo, which is very easily one of the brightest, busiest, and most vibrant of cities on the planet. Tokyo is full to the brim of things to do, from jaw-dropping visual exhibitions from Team Lab, through to magnificent Japanese temples, you're exposed to a wide variety of activities that this city has to offer. And when it comes to foods, it gets even better. From luxurious rooftop bars, down to small restaurants tucked away in quaint side streets, you will forever find new ways to indulge yourself. Now, one of the most famous and busiest districts in Tokyo is the ever-popular area of Shibuya. It is so busy, in fact, that it's home to the two busiest train stations in the world. And of course, I'm talking about Shinjuku and Shibuya. Shinjuku Station alone can see a whopping 3.6 million passengers a day, and Shibuya itself is well known for being the busiest crossing in the world. It also offers fantastic shopping at Shibuya 109, and is a common meeting spot beside the statue of the ever-loyal Hachiko. Although Tokyo is a vast megacity that is home to a staggering 11% of Japan's population, it makes use of its excellent rail services and advanced technological status to keep air pollution well below its recommended threshold. And of course, that's a great offset for the environment. And with the environment in mind, chipping in with today's sponsor, I wanted to ask you what you do with your life to be more environmentally sustainable. For me, one of those changes has been swapping out typical bathroom products for more sustainable options like Native. So, what can I say about Native? It's an aluminium-free and paraben-free deodorant that is available in earth-friendly plastic-free packaging. It's vegan and cruelty-free, it dries quickly and is not sticky to use, and is made from familiar and simple ingredients such as coconut and shea butter. I've been using Native for a little over two months now, and honestly, I'm in love with their deodorant. Native also smells absolutely incredible. There's a wide variety of scents available, including sensitive options, and each scent offers you up to 72 hours of odour protection. My favourite one so far is the Eucalyptus and Mints, which is keeping me fresh through the summer heat. To add to this, Native offers limited edition summer seasonals too, such as Pina Colada and Lakeside Ginger Mule. They're only available until the end of summer, so get them now before they're gone. You save 37 grams of single-use plastic every time you choose Native's plastic-free deodorant. Native is a proud partner of 1% for the planet, and is committed to responsibly sourcing its paper. Now, three plastic-free deodorants would usually cost $39, but if you use my link and code COFFEEHOUSE, you get them for $26 instead. That's over 33% off. And to add to this, you will also get 20% off any body wash or toothpaste. Don't forget to use the code COFFEEHOUSE. Thank you to Native for sponsoring this video, and thank you to you guys for supporting us content creators. Now back to the case. It is here, tucked away in the back streets of Shibuya, that we find the Muto Dental Clinic, a small family-run business owned by, you guessed it, the Muto family. The youngest of this prestigious family was 20-year-old Izumi Muto. Born on June 13, 1986, Izumi had two older brothers, with the youngest of the two being 21-year-old Yuki Muto. Both of their parents, and their parents before them, were dentists or health professionals of some kind. And in true Japanese fashion, the family expected Izumi and her siblings to follow in their footsteps. 
wishing for their children to eventually take over the family health clinic. It's obvious that they would then want it to be passed on to their future grandchildren too. Azumi's eldest brother, who remains unnamed, was already following in his parents' footsteps. He studied hard and managed to achieve top grades at Nihon University. This of course made his parents extremely proud. Now, if his younger siblings could follow suit, they would simply be over the moon. Alongside their dental business, the Muto family also owned a number of real estate properties for rent, some of which they gave to their children to manage and direct. So, as you can probably tell, the family were very affluent, and none of the children would have to worry about money for the rest of their lives. Unless, of course, they were cut off. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here, as that was never going to happen in a professional and civilized family. Right? Well, that's what Azumi's and Yuki's parents also thought. You see, Yuki wasn't the brightest crayon in the box. He had started to academically fall behind his classmates. So, in order to improve his grades, they enrolled him into a nearby prep school. But he still struggled to get high enough grades to qualify to apply for university, or even to qualify for graduating high school. And as for their daughter Azumi, her passion was never really in dentistry. She hated the fate that her parents expected her to follow. And in Japan, this expectation to follow family tradition can be a very heavy burden on children. It's a rather systemic problem, and this expectation of young people is so prevalent that it severely affects the young population's mental health. This even sometimes creates recluses with no aspirations in life. And as many of you may know, these people are known in Japan as hikikomori. It is also one of the reasons that Japan has a relatively high self-inflicted death rate, as people would rather die than be ashamed to their own families. Thinking about it, this is a really sad reality that the country faces. But Azumi was strong-willed, and although her parents pressured her to stay in the family business, she knew it was not for her. So instead, after high school, she studied computer programming and also aspired to become a model and an actor, much to her parents' dismay. Their pressure was so relentless that Azumi actually left her home at the age of 18 for several months in order to better focus on her new aspirations as an actor. This was not a surprise, as the house that the siblings grew up in was described as cold and unloving, and the pressure that these children faced from their parents often drove a rift between and within their generations, making them more like rivals than siblings. During this time, Azumi was filming for a low-budget adaptation of the anime Cream Lemon. The film was rated 15, making it a raunchy feature by Japanese standards. And you can probably see where this is going, but it went down horribly unwell with Azumi's parents. In the end, Izumi couldn't escape the cold family household. Money became an issue, and just a few months after leaving her family, she begrudgingly returned. But her parents would reluctantly allow her to continue studying programming, and even allowed her to work her modelling jobs from home. The family were, surprisingly, just happy to have her back. That was all of them, except her brother Yuki. Although Izumi was smart and succeeding in her chosen path, away from family tradition, Yuki's ambitions were going in the opposite direction. Not only did he want to pursue dentistry, but he also wanted to please his parents too. However, sadly, he was not able to keep up with his studies. While growing up, he was told that he would inherit the family dentistry and do great things for his family. And this of course put great pressure on him to do his parents and grandparents proud. And yet, who was his sister? smart enough to do what he couldn't, but still turning her back on family tradition. While he tried so hard for his parents' approval, she simply didn't care. And Azumi could feel the hate coming from Yuki. She knew that her brother was not fond of her, and this scared her greatly. Azumi often told her friends that Yuki creeped her out. She could never tell what he was thinking, and to add to this, he had a strange demeanour to him. Getting uncomfortable for just a moment, but by the way that he stared at her, she knew that his thoughts were never good or pure. Another friend also claimed that Yuki's feelings towards Azumi were much worse than just a typical brother-sister relationship. This is just speculation by his friends, but apparently, he at times had talked about her with disgusting thoughts on his mind. At school, Yuki was seen as a rather awkward loner. He didn't have many friends, and mainly kept himself in his bedroom at home. And despite this, very little did Yuki's parents know that there was a rage slowly growing within their son. A rage that was ready to boil over. December the 30th, 2006. The new year was fast approaching, and in Japan, their various New Year's traditions were just around the corner. 
different from the rest of the world. These traditions often include visiting shrines to pay respects, show appreciation, and wish for good health and fortune in the coming year. The Muto family were no different in this instance. They readied up for their New Year's traditions, ready to pay their respects. Or, at least some of them were. While the parents and eldest brother had travelled to Fukushima to visit extended family, Azumi and Yuki decided to stay at home instead. Azumi simply had no desire to go, while Yuki, on the other hand, had a study camp scheduled over the New Year's break. But the very night before they left, Azumi, Yuki, and the mother had unfortunately argued, and of course the topic was about tradition and how they were not progressing in life. The atmosphere of that fight was still thick in the air, even after the majority of the family had left, and with Azumi and Yuki left alone in the house, both of them remained upset. Now, Japanese folks are known to be reserved, and they often keep their real thoughts and feelings to themselves. This is especially pertinent for women, but Izumi wasn't like the other girls, as she would often share her truthful opinions, which most of the time were not appreciated. And Izumi was no different in this instance either. She was still reeling from the argument the night before, and entering Yuki's bedroom, she planned to confront him over the many things he had said. After all, although their mother had sided with Yuki, she was no longer here anymore. Yuki told his sister that he was ashamed of her, and that she shouldn't be a part of the family anymore. And this, of course, infuriated Izumi. As the argument quickly reignited, Izumi shouted at Yuki, telling him that he would never amount to anything worthwhile, that he lacked ambition, and that he'd be left with nothing. And tragically, this made him snap in a fit of rage. He grabbed his wooden kendo sword, and then began to repeatedly strike it across Izumi's face. As Izumi fought back, Yuki's beatings became harder, faster, and stronger. He desperately wanted her to shut up, and that was no matter what it took. January the 3rd, 2007. The Muto family were ready to return home and get back to work after the New Year's holiday. Good timing, as they were starting to grow worried. Azumi had been radio silent ever since shortly before the New Year, and as for Yuki, he was relatively quiet too. Saying that, shortly before they got home, he did message his parents to warn them of a foul smell. Apparently, his fish had died shortly before he left for school, and he had not yet disposed of it. He therefore asked them not to enter his room. However, upon returning home, the stench was so overwhelming that they simply couldn't ignore it. And so his grandfather, Mamoru, offered to go in and clean up the dead fish. But after entering his room, it was obvious to see that the lone shark fish he kept in his tank was very much alive and still swimming around. This was odd, because there was definitely a smell coming from somewhere. Looking around, Mamoru found the smell emanating from the closet, and opening the door, he was met with a pile of stacked garbage bags, and the smell coming from them was horrendous. Upon cutting open one of these bags came the sight of flesh and a lot of blood, and stumbling back in shock, Mamoru and the rest of the family called the police immediately. Tragically, the body inside the bag was identified to be Izumi, and expecting that Yuki had something to do with this, the family waited for him to return home before the police arrested him. When the news broke, tabloids erupted with speculation, claiming that apparently he was a necrophile and a cannibal. The police would ultimately deny these claims, minus the incestuous ones. Yuki folded and confessed to authorities almost immediately, and after breaking down in the interrogation room, he shared the grisly details of his crime. After beating his sister with his kendo sword, he grabbed a nearby towel and wrapped it around her neck. With white knuckles, he held this for a total of three minutes, counting from 1 to 180 in the process. To his dismay, Azumi was still breathing after this, so instead, he dragged her to the bathroom before pushing her head underwater. And this, after being beaten and strangled, sadly ended her life. After a short breather, Yuki cleaned the crime scene, and next he made his way to the kitchen where he grabbed a knife from the counter. He then collected a saw and returned to the bathroom, and there, he removed his sister's clothes and began to dismember her body. Yuki left almost nothing intact, and horrifyingly, he would even take the knife to his sister's most intimate areas. After removing these parts from her body, he then put these into a garbage bag, where he then took the bag to the kitchen and ran it through the garbage disposal. Yuki then bagged the rest of her body into heavy-duty garbage bags, where he then stored them in his own bedroom cabinet, under the fish tank, and even in his sister's bedroom. Since most Japanese bathrooms are essentially wet rooms, Yuki was able to effectively clean the entire scene with ease, 
simply taking the shower's head to the walls and floor. After he was satisfied with his cleaning, he then packed his bags full of clothes and study gear, ready to go to a study camp later that day. After this, he then added a pair of his sister's panties into his own bag. And after leaving the house, her remains were left in the property, undiscovered for several days. Yuki's defense tried to prove that Yuki was not mentally capable of understanding his crime, and could not tell the difference between right and wrong. After being examined by a psychiatrist, he was found not to be mentally stable during the time he had murdered his sister. Specialists would argue that he had diminished capacity prior to the crime, and he was criminally insane during the moments he was mutilating her body. Needless to say, his defense insisted that due to this, he should not be held legally responsible for his actions. But prosecutors denied this motion, and believed that the bad blood between them was a strong enough motive to kill Izumi. Yuki was therefore charged with the murder of Izumi Muto, and further was charged for the desecration of a corpse. Fast forward a little over one year, and in May of 2008, Yuki Muto was found guilty of the murder. For all of this, he was given a grand total of only eight years in prison. He was acquitted of the desecration charge on the grounds that he had diminished mental responsibility. This was despite Yuki giving a perfect account of what exactly happened leading up to his crime, and he further showed that he had a clear memory of the murder and knew exactly what he was doing. So fortunately, the Tokyo High Court found this to be reason enough to retract his initial sentencing. They changed his guilty verdict to that of murder and desecration, changing his sentence from 8 years to 12, which, if you ask me, is still a very lenient sentence. Now, I often say this while covering Japanese true crime, but Japan in general tends to be a very safe place to live. Saying that, all stories from here tend to be wild. And here's another reason why. During his trial, Yuki's parents bought the best lawyers that money could buy. And surprisingly, this was for his defense, as they accepted his horrific actions. During this trial, they also described how often Izumi insulted her brother, how quiet and kind he was, and how much he disappointed them. And I feel that pretty much sums up Azumi's parents. Despite her being murdered and dismembered in her very own home, they turned their backs on her in court. Yuki Muto was due for release in the year 2021, which means that he's out there walking the streets of Tokyo as I speak right now. And all in the meanwhile, Azumi lost her life. The Muto family were torn apart due to Yuki's seemingly impulsive actions. And although Yuki wanted to follow family traditions, he ironically removed the possibility for both Azumi and himself. Azumi never wanted to pave her way forward in the family business, but those who were supposed to love her unconditionally resented her for it, and eventually, she was cruelly murdered for this positive trait. In Japan, there is an immense pressure to honour your family, and this expectation can be unbearable for many. So, it does beg the question, if there wasn't so much negative reinforcement from their parents, would Yuki have killed his sister? Or was something much more sinister at play? Sadly, we will never know. So I think that pretty much wraps up today's case, folks. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting, or you learned something new, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. And again, a big thank you to Native for sponsoring today's video. I genuinely love your product. If you guys are looking for something new and sustainable, then please give them a try. So, what are your thoughts on the case of Azumi Muto? Do you think that Japanese tradition has anything to do with this, or do you think he was just a troubled child? Now as always, please share your thoughts in the comments section down below, and I'll be back again real soon for another video. Until the moment arrives though, please remember to look after each other and stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye. And tragically, this made him snap in a fit of rage. He grabbed his wooden kendo sword, and then began to repeatedly strike it across Izumi's head. Didn't like that, did you? Nah, I didn't think so. The studio is no place for a cat.